This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 31. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey everyone, it's Matt. Thanks for joining me today in session 31 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. And I am really pleased to be joined by someone who uh, you guys have asked to hear from quite a bit. Uh, that, and I'm being joined by none other than uh, Dr. Pat McGreevy. And we talk uh, extensively about teaching functional skills. And so uh, he is the author of Essential for Living. And uh, so we get into a little bit of, of uh, how that whole system works as well. Uh, and we certainly take many of your questions, too. So thank you for all of you who uh, took some time to write in and uh, submit some listener questions. It's been a segment of the podcast that I've been enjoying quite a bit. Uh, let's see. I also want to just give you a heads up. Uh, you know, the funny thing that happened is, uh, you know, this was a podcast that almost wasn't. Uh, and let me take a minute to explain that. Um, I uh, reached out to Pat over a year ago, believe it or not, and we had this kind of initial Skype conversation in uh, June, I think, of uh, 2016, and we, uh, we we should have just hit record and had that, and that would have been an adequate episode, And uh, but we basically talked about what we would talk about on the podcast, and uh, one thing led to another, and schedules got busy and things like that, and next thing you know... I bumped into him at uh, ABAI in Denver, and we said, okay, we definitely have to do this. And so fortunately, we did. And uh, so here we are today. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with Pat. He and I kind of uh, got on very well, and uh, so well, in fact, that I, I made a few uh, rookie interviewing mistakes, and we got off on a tangent or two in this very long conversation. So uh, I uh, edited some of that out just for the sake of, uh, of brevity, and so if you hear something, uh, you know, the audio clip here or there, that is, uh, that is my uh, uh, fumbling attempts at, at uh, you know, kind of paring down the conversation to a, a reasonable length. So, um, But again, I think this is a, is a you know, kind of fun conversation. I think many of you who work with individuals with more severe disabilities uh, will, will get a lot out of. And I, again, it's something that uh, you guys have been asking for for quite a long time. I'm really psyched to be able to deliver that. So uh, before we get to that interview, I do want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by Britain Behavioral Consulting. Uh, that is uh, B-R-I-T-T-O-N, behavioralconsulting.com, and that is the independent fieldwork supervision service by none other than Dr. Lisa Britton, who appeared in session 29 of the Behavioral Observations podcast, and she provides high-quality independent fieldwork supervision for uh, people who are seeking uh, certification preparing for the test and uh, all of the above. You know, if you go back to session 29, you can hear all about Lisa's uh, qualifications and background and her unique approach to providing supervision, particularly in a remote context. So I know some of you are already reaching out to her, both as potential supervisees and also some uh, BCBAs are, you know, kind of uh, hitting Lisa up for some questions. Hey, you know, I'm in this situation, I'm in that situation, looking for guidance and things like that. So Again, I really appreciate you guys uh, supporting the uh, sponsors of this program. And uh, so um, I think that's pretty much it for preamble. We've got quite a long conversation here, so let's get right to it. So without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Pat McGreevy. Dr. Pat McGreevy, thank you for joining me today on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? Good. Excellent. Well, this is uh, certainly a treat. You have been one of the most highly requested guests. Uh, one of the things that's fun about doing a podcast that's, uh, that's kind of interactive, like the one we have here, is that I've got people who send me emails with all sorts of really cool ideas for topics and guests and things like that, and functional skills, and Pat McGreevy, and functional skills, and Pat McGreevy. Those are very frequent uh, uh, things that come in, so it's great that we have a chance to to uh, sit down and do this interview, especially having uh, been, uh, I guess, uh, uh, having it been in plans for <laughs> the better part of the year now. <laughs> um, so we finally got it on the calendar. So this is fantastic. 
Um, so we got a whole host of questions here ready for you. And, and I think the first question I want to get into is um, what I ask all my guests as far as an opening question is concerned is how did you get into psychology or behavior analysis and things like that? Can you tell us a story about how you first came into the field and what was it like at the time? Sure. Um, I uh, originally got into psychology uh, undergraduate at the University of Iowa. And uh, after about my uh, third or fourth course, um, I began to realize I didn't really want to be a clinical psychologist. I didn't want to spend my life testing individuals and um, because I went through a couple of clinical courses where we had to do all the IQ testing and the projective tests. And I remember doing a Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory one time and a couple of Rorschachs and some stuff like that. And I just couldn't imagine myself spending my time in the future doing that sort of thing. So one day, one of the students was going over to the University of Iowa Hospital School and he was going to volunteer with the children over there, the children who were severely handicapped, and he wanted to know if I would go along. So I went along with him, and I spent a couple of hours with the kids, and I immediately fell in love with it. And uh, then went ahead and got a um, master's degree in special education, and toward the end of that time was introduced to science and human behavior. And once I read Science and Human Behavior, boy, it was was all over then so that was the that was the game-changing moment for you without a doubt uh i was uh, i was teaching at the time after my after i got my special ed degree uh which you know i had a lot of courses but i didn't know how to teach at all and quickly realized that and i was um i was a single fellow in those days and uh i was commuting back and forth to work with a school psychologist and he had drive one week and I drive the next and uh, cause it was about 40 miles. And, uh, uh, we decided that we would read science and human behavior together and we would have our little discussions in the car on the way back and forth. So we had a small, like two person study group as we were both reading science and human behavior. Oh, that's cool. And that's how it started. And, uh, and then about four or five chapters into Science and Human Behavior, I did my first little, what I would describe, my first little behavior project, my behavior change project. and was quite successful, and I was quite pleased with myself, even though I barely knew anything at all. Um, those two things kind of came together. And then I went, oh, oh um, probably a year after that, I went to a seminar that Ogden Lindsley was doing in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and uh, I spent a couple of days with him. And then I did I went to another one of his in California. So I went to two of them. And then I, uh, I wrote him a letter and asked him about being a graduate student with him. And I didn't hear for almost an entire year. And uh, in April of 19... 19- in 72, I was in my little apartment in Davenport, Iowa, on a Saturday morning. In fact, it was the Saturday before Easter, 1972. And I picked up the phone, and he said, hello, is this Pat McGreevy? I said, yeah. He said, this is Ogden Lindsley. And I damn near fell down. <laughs> and and I couldn't imagine that somebody I hadn't heard from for a year would all of a sudden, on a Saturday before Easter, call me. And he did. And he kept me on the line for about... An hour and a half. Oh my gosh! And um, and I was just literally in the first fifteen minutes, I was scared to death. I didn't even know how to respond. I was probably stammering and stuttering and doing all sorts of things. But anyway, at the end of an hour and a half conversation, uh, we had an appointment for me to drive to Lawrence, Kansas, to meet him and to interview. Which a couple of weeks later I did, and two months later I was on the Lawrence campus and I was his graduate student. Very cool. What a, what a cool story. Um, I, I do want to kind of just hit the pause button here for a second, though, because uh, this would be a good opportunity to tell people who may not be familiar with, uh, with uh, Ogden, who Ogden Lindsay um, was, uh, a little bit about him. You know, I heard all sorts of stories about him from my major professor, Jim Johnson, as a graduate student. He used to, you know, talk about 
this this really kind of uh you know eccentric guy who had all these kind of uh you know neat stories and things like that so can you take a few minutes and just kind of describe to the audience who Ogden was and kind of what what you see as his contribution to the field I know this is probably like way beyond we could probably do a whole podcast on this as we were talking about before we hit the record button but if you could just kind of give us an overview that would be great sure I'll try to keep it brief uh the um Ogden was studying at Brown University, working on a doctorate in psychology. And uh, he began to be more aware of the work of B.F. Skinner at Harvard. And so when he was about ready to start his dissertation at Brown, he left Brown and went to Harvard and essentially started all over again. And at nearly the same time, Nate Azra did the same thing left his doctoral program and came to Harvard. And they both were there at the same time. And um, uh, then Ogden got his degree with B.F. Skinner and opened the the first human operant conditioning laboratory ever, anywhere. Wow. Very first one ever at the Met State Hospital in Boston. And, um, And the patients were essentially schizophrenics, adult schizophrenics. And um, there's lots of places for people to go to learn a little bit about some of that history. But um, anyway, that was him. And it, and the measurement was all uh, frequency or rate based. In other words, uh, he took Skinner's notion that the basic datum of behavior uh, was uh, frequency or rate. Uh, in those days, it was you could people called it either one, including Skinner. And um, uh, and so individuals were, their behavior was recorded essentially by machines. And, um, and then he did that for several years. And then he accepted a position at Kansas University in the School of Education. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to take that same technology and move it into education, move it out of the laboratory and into education. And at the same time, he began developing what became the derivative, the second derivative of the cumulative recorder or the cumulative record. In other words, the the what was plotted on the cumulative record were was was count was every time an event occurred, it was plotted on the cumulative record and the slope of the cumulative record was the rate or the frequency. Mm hmm. Now, what Ogden wanted to do is to take the next, to to use a standard way to measure the next derivative, which would mean, what do you do with those frequencies? So you have 10 in 10 minutes, or 20 in a day, or whatever the frequency or rate is, and how do you measure the growth of those? And so at about that time, along with Eric Cotton and several other people, they developed what first was called the standard behavior chart for a very short period of time and later became called the standard acceleration chart, the root word of acceleration, deceleration. Right. And it became a standard way to measure the change in rate across time. And at, and at that time, um, because the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis had started in 1968, and this time frame was 1968, 69, 70. It was quite common in our field, and still is, to um, people to draw their own charts. And so effectively, the display is a function of how the chart is drawn. And anyone who uses Excel today knows that, that when you plot data points on Excel, Excel will every so often switch the dimensions of the axes based on the range of scores or frequencies that are plotted um, oh, with, sure. that, with that instrument. Yep. But people would do it by hand in those days long before Excel. And so Og's idea was to take the fact that, that, that uh, certainly within species, the, um, the, the slope on the cumulative record was standard. It was always the same. And 
the slope on the standard acceleration chart would again always be the same. In other words, the display could not be a function of who was drawing it or how it was drawn. It was mm. always the same. Okay. And um, and then some teaching procedures that evolved from standard measurement became called precision teaching, and that became a common term. Uh, and but. Precision teaching didn't so much have to do with the chart itself as it did with certain teaching procedures, fluency-based sorts of things that evolved from people who used the standard chart. But and, and that was Ogden's in many ways, according to him anyway, was his major contribution uh, uh, to the field. Um, but the field didn't then and to this day has yet to largely accept that notion of standard measurement. Indeed. And it, and it goes on as if, essentially, now there is there are a small group of us um, that meet once a year that have carried on this tradition. We were recently kicked off the uh, examination, the task list. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at that time, we were the only item kicked off, which was quite interesting. But... Um, so we're now no longer represented on the task list or which informs the certification exam. Um, and um, there has been quite a bit of opposition to us over the years. Um, and uh, 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 but we carry on. And um, and that's essentially what Ogden and Eric started. I see. Well, I will be having uh, another highly requested guest on the program, Rick Cabina, and so he's going to hopefully well, elucidate. Rick, Rick will take. Oh, you can just tell him about where I stopped, and he'll take. He'll he'll pick up right from there. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, having spoken to him briefly uh, a few times, he is uh, certainly a, a very passionate advocate for the acceleration chart. And I have to tell you, Pat, you know. Um, uh, it's an area which, just to confess a little bit, I'm, I'm I'm kind of ignorant on. I remember preparing for the exam. I mean, I you know, Jim mentioned it a few times in graduate school, but we didn't use it in our research um, in the lab that we were working in. Uh, and he would talk about the chart in conjunction with these stories about Og, um, but uh, it wasn't something that was in our use at the time. And uh, you know, I remember preparing for the exam back in the day when it, there were elements of acceleration on the test mm -hmm. and, and just learning enough to make a, you know, to make a, a, a wild guess into a somewhat narrower, perhaps high, higher probability guess. You know? <laughs> so I, I learned some just basic terms just to be able to take a, a, a somewhat less than wild stab at the answer. And uh, so I am very much looking forward to uh, having a, 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 uh, deeper dive into this topic. So, but uh, I think you, you, you did a good job kind of whetting the appetite on this. And so I look forward to picking up that conversation with, uh, with Rick down the road. So um, well, Ogden, Ogden used to say probably within a couple of, in, in a couple of sentences, the easiest way to frame the argument is this. If the chart isn't standard, then it's not a constant. Therefore it's a variable. Yeah. So the display is a function of how it was drawn. Mm -hmm. And the only time that hand-drawn charts don't have that problem is pie charts with percents, cir circular pie charts. Pie charts are standard no matter who draws them. And, 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 and you don't have that difficulty. Now, you can still make the pie a little bit larger and create a little bit of a distortion there. But with regard to the angles, you can't create distortions on a pie chart. But, um, uh, you know, if you look today at all the charts in, in our journals, uh, goodness sake, uh, it's quite common practice that if things don't show much of acceleration, you simply redraw them until they do by simply shrinking or stretching the various axes. Mm -hmm. You can stretch the vertical axis to make it, uh, and you can collapse the horizontal axis. And, um, and if you do... Um, the the slope will go up with you or go down depending on what you want it to do and um and uh so therefore um 
and and if if we as as behavior analysts want to belong to the natural science group, which many people do, that's not a tenant. Natural science does not accept that, and sure. would not accept that. If we want to stay in the social science club, that's common practice. In the social science group, with psychology and sociology and all of that, that's quite that's quite common practice. In the natural science club, it's 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 incompatible with the conduct of science. Got it. You have to have standard units and standard measures and standard displays. Uh, you know, there are things like the Richter scale and all sorts of things, and so that's you know that's that's the issue. I see. I see. Well, I look forward to uh, learning more about that and uh, becoming slightly less ignorant on that topic uh, over the uh, the coming uh, coming months. So, um, so let's. So you, you, you go to Kansas, you study with Og. Uh, what, what happens from there? Can you kind of give us a kind of a career arc, if you will, and kind of take it to the point of where you are now with um, what you're doing these days? Well, Ogden told us, told me when I got there um, uh, that he was going to teach us what he thought we wouldn't learn from other people. And so the basic principles of behavior, he didn't teach us those. We would simply go to, there were so many other places and sources you could get that from. But what he was going to concentrate with us on is things that he, in the two years I was there, things that you couldn't easily learn from other people. So we were very, very ingrained in the whole measurement issue and how it started and what it was. And so he spent a lot of time with us, hour after hour after hour. We'd go out to his house and he'd put a big bowl of, bowl of soup on and we'd sit there for hours and hours. And he would, um, you know, he talked about, you know, how uh, discontinuous measures and things like intervals and and interval measurements and partial and whole intervals and all of that and time sampling and and trials to criterion and all the other stuff and and then converting it to percent correct how that distorted things um and so that was that was what i learned more from ogden than virtually anything else and then of course we had other issues you know we talked about other kinds of things behaviorally and he had these couched in education classes because when he came, there weren't classes in place in the College of Education. So uh, later on, when it came time for me to uh, try to become certified when I moved to Florida, uh, my my uh, 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 transcript had or had the same problem that lots of other people who had been in the field a while had. If you looked at the courses, you couldn't identify any of them as behavioral. Of course, when you looked at my advisor, then that tipped the balance. And so we were given some allowances there, not only myself, but dozens of other people um, who didn't have anything in their coursework that would suggest that they had behavior analysis training, but the people they studied would certainly would. And so then from there, then um, I went back to teaching a while, and then eventually uh, I had several university positions and eventually decided that I could either be a university professor and publish, which I did for a short period of time, or I could be a practitioner. And in my way of looking at it, make an equally important contribution. And so I decided on the practitioner. After my second little stint at the university work at LSU, I decided it was time to go to where I really wanted to be. And that was with the kids and the adults. And so that's what I've spent the rest of my time doing. Can you talk about the, the different kind of populations you've worked with over the years? Yeah. The, the population that I first started with as a teacher in 1968 were severely and multiply handicapped kids. It was just a hodgepodge of all sorts of kids who basically had, you know, were severely and profoundly impaired, a couple of kids with Down syndrome, and those were the higher level kids, and kids that were lower level kids that were um, 
hermaphrodite, deaf and blind, um, um, very severely involved individuals. And those are the kids that always attracted me. And then on top of that, when people found out that I enjoyed teaching those kids, then they would send me kids who were sort of a little bit higher marginally, but who had severe problem behavior. And they found out that I liked those kids just as much, if not more. <laughs> so they would send me those kids. So my teaching at the end, toward the end of my second year in my first teaching assignment, people commonly in the school district told me this, that they referred to my class as the B-Mod class. Uh -huh. Because I would take on, I mean, I took on, I took on a 17-year-old who'd never taken a shower in his life or a bath, either one, uh, a person who, who stole everything that was humanly possible to steal uh, people who would bolt out into the street uh, people who um, you know all sorts of different things self-injury aggression all sorts of stuff and so I, I just developed quite an interest in that and then when um, then I combined that with all the behavioral knowledge I was accumulating over the years, including all the time with Og. And, and um, when I went to LSU, I was on the faculty and in special education, but I only taught the severely handicapped sequence. Uh, I taught the behavior analysis classes and the severely handicapped sequence. Um, and um, so um, it was always my interest. I see. So obviously there's with that level of uh, severity, there's ample opportunities to teach what we're going to, I guess, refer to as functional skills. Uh, but before going into that, can you give me what your working definition of functional skills is? You know, so when we talk about this, we can all be on the same page. Yeah, and it, 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 it was tough for us to do this because you have the the term function as it's used in in speech and language and it it has a different meaning there mm -hmm. then you have a common ordinary sort of everyday use of the term functional and then you have function used in behavior analysis in a very specific way having to do with outcome so when we sat down to put this into the book uh, it represented a, a pretty much of a dilemma, but here's, here's what we came up with. We took some definitions of functional skills that were, had been in special education for a number of years. And the first one was that it would be required in another setting. So if you're teaching somebody, a functional skill is a skill that would be required somewhere else. Okay then it's a skill that would be taught that is taught in um in a similar circumstance to that in which it would be required later okay see what i mean it would be um so that um you know i might teach somebody to reach out and squeeze some theraputty to build their 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 but that isn't the circumstance that would be required later what would be required later is reaching out and grasping a spoon or whatever it is. And so you could have a skill, you could have a little component type thing where you're reaching and squeezing the therapy, but that isn't what you'd be required to do later. So we'd make it functional by at some point inserting a spoon or something that you would actually have to grasp. And then the third component of a functional skill is a skill that if it's not in your repertoire, someone would have to do that for you. So if you can't wash your hands, someone will have to wash them for you because you can't go your life without having your hands washed. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. if, if somebody, if you can't feed yourself, someone else will have to do it for you. If you can't open a door or turn a doorknob, somebody else will have to do that for you. You can't put your shoes on, someone will have to do that for you. And then the fourth component is something, a, a, a skill is functional if it provides access to your most preferred items, activities, and people. In other words, your reinforcers. If nice. it gets 
you or your at least your preferred items. We're not always sure they're reinforcers, but they're certainly preferred items and activities. Um, and if a skill gets you access to those and to a certain extent helps you avoid or escape from things you find aversive, you see what I mean? Sure. So, um, you know, uh, it would also fall into that. And so that's how we sort of came down on the notion of what constitutes a functional skill. Got it. Got it. That's uh, well, a nice little rundown there. And those all make quite a bit of sense. Um, so you mentioned your book, uh, the uh, or curriculum, um, The Essentials for Living. And so what I want to do is kind of transition to talking about that for a minute. Uh, because we do have questions about that. And one of them comes from uh, um, uh, one of my listeners, Caroline. And she writes in, um, let's see, at what point in his career did he recognize that our field needed the Essentials for Living curriculum? Was there a specific event that made him realize, wow, I really need to write a book on this? Uh, and I guess tangentially, you know, can you tell a story about how you developed it? Was there, was there a particular client or pattern of clients? So uh, if you can describe that, that would be great. Well, for years, um, functional skills curricula, or as they were sometimes called curriculum-based assessments, were quite common in the field of special education. Now, they weren't early when I started in 1968. Um, when I got into that classroom, I saw right away that the materials they gave me didn't look like anything that was worthwhile teaching the children at all. And uh, so I went back to the university where I had been in my master's program. And there was a fellow who had joined the faculty just about the time that I was leaving. And I asked him if he would let me uh, audit his classes because he was teaching, you know, functional skill type stuff. And I didn't have any background in that at all. And so I realized pretty early through his help that when you sat down in front of some of these kids, I'll give you an example. Uh, the laminating machines had first come out in the late 1960s. And I taught one of my first little guys, Vernon. I thought, well, men and women, I got this list of survival vocabulary, see. And uh, I taught uh, him, uh, laminated a few cards, and I taught him men and women so that when he saw the word men, which would appear on a restroom door, he could say men. And when he saw women, he could say women. See, he couldn't read at all but prior to that, but I thought, well, he'll be able to recognize them, see? But I didn't pay close enough attention to what the actual functional skill was, so I taught him to see the little laminated card men and see the little laminated card men and the laminated card women. So he'd see the card men, and he learned to say men, and he'd see the card women, and he learned to say women. But then we went out on a shopping trip, and he looked right up at the sign over the restroom door, said women, and walked right in. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've heard a similar story of uh, yeah. teaching kids to uh, use a telephone to call their, you know, yes. a, a loved one or whatever. They learn the sequence of numbers and then hang up, you know. <laughs> yeah, they don't, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so then you said to yourself, though, wait a minute, it isn't naming it that matters. It's when you see the sign, you know what to do. Are there kids who can see the sign men, know that's where they should go? but never could say men. In other words, could never read it technically, but know how to respond when they see it. And the answer is yes. And so then early on, then later on, I was teaching, and of course, it was all about functional skills, this and this and that. And I'd find these little corny little things like, like counting by, by fives and nickels to a dollar. And that sounded functional on the surface until you realize no one would ever do that. So that's pretty stupid. <laughs> no one would ever count by fives to a dollar. So that was idiotic. And and so then I we began to, in other words, in other words, teach counting with coins was very difficult because you had to count by ones and fives and tens and twenty fives and go back and forth and back and forth. And then we started with kids. We they they'd see fifty cents in those days. They'd see fifty on a soda machine and they would know that you would pick up two quarters and put that in there. In the early days you couldn't get change in a soda machine, so you had to have two quarters. You could do it with dimes and nickels, but we taught them two quarters. When you see 50, you put these two things up there and you get your soda. And it was a lot easier. So we got into that. Well, then as the autism movement literally erupted all over the place and we have saw all these kids that effectively were never seen before, 
And then later on, we saw all sorts of kids who were now being called autistic, whom 10 years ago would never have gotten that label. Mm -hmm. They were simply developmentally disabled, nonspecific, which was most kids with developmental disabilities. So anyway, and then we saw that with all the explosion in services, most of these kids, even though they were, geez, 12, 13, 9, 10, you know, they were sitting there with laminated cards in front of them. Uh, and they were doing kind of stuff that you would do developmentally. In other words, they were on the VB map, which is a terrific instrument, or they were on the Ables, or they were on the Denver, or they were on one of those curricula, like even the, the curriculum from the New England Center, that first part of the ACE curriculum, um, was all very developmental. It was designed to help kids catch up to their typically developing peers. But then you look around at the population that's now called autistic, and you look at them and easily 80% of them, maybe close to 90% of them, will never attain that. That will never be. And as they get a little older, it becomes more evident with many of them, as it becomes evident that some of them will catch up. And so did it make any sense to be teaching them skills that were designed to help them catch up when those were not the same skills that would help for a better life? And so I remember sitting down one time with Mark Sundberg, whom I went to first after I had the idea. Um, and I said, here's what I want to do. I want to pick up where the VB map leaves off. And the kids that don't make any progress and don't get to first grade and aren't going to be academic kids, which is not only a whole bunch of kids who don't have the label autism, but an increasing number of kids who do. Mm hmm and I simply want to make an instrument that follows up with verbal behavior, emphasizes language, but teaches them skills that will matter in the rest of their life. And so that would have occurred about, um, let me see, that would have occurred about 2002. I see. Can you talk about Mark's reaction to your idea? He was immediately supportive. Okay, cool. With with literally no hesitation, I was kind of I kind of thought I wasn't I didn't know him terribly well in those days, and well I just I caught him at a conference and I said I've been wanting to talk to you about something. Have you got some time? And it was late in the afternoon, and he said, Yeah, you want to have a beer? So we did. We sat down and had a beer. <laughs> That's and where I, most of the good ideas get crafted, right? <laughs> absolutely. And I sat down with him and I said, Here's what I want to do. What do you think? And he looked at me and he said, go for it. We absolutely need that. Awesome. So that reminds me of a, another question that Carolyn wrote in. She said, um, her second question is, you know, what, what behaviors or responses occur or don't occur over time to signal to a practitioner that a client may need to focus more on daily living skills and less so on, you know, what we might call the VB map, ABLES type skills. In other words, how long do you recommend throwing everything you've got in terms of the developmental curricula uh, before transitioning or moving into more of a functional skills sure. program? How do you, how do you, how do you sure. make that decision if you're a, a clinician working well, with kids out there? A lot of people have asked us that question over the years. And so we did, we, we have some new companion teaching manuals to Essential for a Living that are on our website. They're simply PDF documents. They're free downloads. And this is the second one of our companion manuals. So if you go to EssentialForLiving.com and you go to the companion manuals, you'll see a, you'll see a, a menu for that. You could, this is number two, deciding what to teach. And there's a diagram in there, and it describes in detail the, you know, the very question that you ask. But basically, just to give you a sample of it, if kids are not acquiring with, after lots of intensive intervention, if they're not acquiring matching skills, particularly arbitrary matching. That would be matching pictures to objects, uh, 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 pictures to activities, uh, rather than identical matching. If you're not getting arbitrary matching, which is all other types of matching other than identical matching, that's a problem. If you're not acquiring at least a reasonable amount of imitation skill, in other words, if you can't watch other kids not just adults, but other kids, and don't have any tendency to imitate what they're doing, 
that's not going to help you in an included environment because to make you successful in an included environment, it's going to rely on the fact that you can see what other kids do, and at least there's some tendency to imitate it. Mm -hmm. But if you can't or don't do that, that's generally not a good sign. If you're not vocal, if you don't use spoken word to communicate, there are some kids who, who don't use spoken word who can still operate in academic environments, but boy, they have to have some pretty specific arrangements to do that. There are kids who can use augmentative devices and still operate in an academic environment, but they've got to have incredibly large vocabularies. They have to be able to do lots and lots of things. If you have a kid who has a picture exchange board or picture exchange book and has six mans with pictures, you're not going to operate in an academic environment with that you're not going to be able to perform academic or pre-academic skills. You don't have enough language to do it. Got See it. I mean? Yeah. Then, then some other things. If you don't have a tacting repertoire, and many people would suggest, I know Mark often talks about at least four or 500 tacks, at least that many. In fact, that's just bare minimum because most kids will get to kindergarten with three or 4,000. And if our kids don't don't get there with at least four or five hundred, um, they're going to be at a significant disadvantage. And then introverbals, where you can begin to answer questions and carry on conversations. Those introverbals have to be based on your tact repertoire. If you have a limited tact repertoire, the only answers to questions you'll probably ever require will be things that are scripted, which will have very little meaning. Mm -hmm. So those are some sample items that if those things aren't occurring, and, and, and now if they're not occurring in the beginning, that's fine because you can start some intensive intervention with the VB map that might get those kids, many kids, <clears throat> to, you know, fill in those gaps. But if they're not filled in, if they're not beginning to be filled in after two to three years of intensive intervention, one-to-one, -one, that's not beginning to look like that youngster can function even marginally in an academic environment. I see. All right. So those are some pretty concrete things to look at just to make sure I heard you correctly. So there's, you know, arbitrary matching, reasonable imitation skills, um, some sort of vocal verbal behavior. And if it's with some sort of speech generation device, uh, uh, verbal behavior or, that, that is, has a, a large repertoire of, of, or it could be somebody with quite a number of signs. Yes, yes, of course. It, signs would work too. Thank you. But what doesn't work is even a, even a repertoire of 15, 20, 30 pictures. That doesn't, no, that's not enough. Got it. That won't get you into an academic world. I see. And then the, 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 the challenges with tacting and, and by extension, uh, interverbal. So, all right. So that's a... Those are some pretty uh, concrete things for people to think about. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a quick break in the conversation to let you know that we do have continuing education units available. If you go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEs, uh, you'll find that we have eight episodes right now that uh, are set up to deliver type two continuing education units. And so we've got stuff on topics such as the functional analysis and uh, treatment of challenging behaviors, the uh, ethics of self-care. We've got CEs on supervision and acceptance and commitment therapy and all sorts of cool stuff. So uh, head on over to behavioral observations forward slash get CEs to check it out. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Pat. More generally, uh, you know, how, how does one get started with the essentials for life? I think we can both agree that you know, I, I ordered the curriculum and I opened it up and I'm thumbing through it and I'm, I'm just looking at this and I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm just being very transparent with you here. I'm going, my God, this is, this is a pretty, uh, overwhelming and, uh, you know, um, yep. Everybody said that. Yeah. Yeah. The word stereo instructions comes to mind and, you know, um, and, uh, um, so how, how do you, 
Is, is there a way you can kind of de demystify the process a little bit? You know, let, let's say someone identifies a learner who, you know, by dint of those uh, items that you just kind of rattle off there would be appropriate for a functional skills curriculum. Um, they happen across your website and they say, ah, okay, well, you know, based on what I'm reading here, this looks like it would be a good fit for this, uh, this, this student or these, this cohort of students. They order it and things like that. They get it, you know, they get it in the mail, they open it up and they're like, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> this is a, this That's is not exactly the most common reaction. The really most common reaction, if you don't mind my forgive me for being a little crass for the moment, is oh shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In fact, we, we call it the oh shit factor of essential for living because people say it all the time. They see it publicly, <laughs> come up to the table, they open the book, they go, oh shit, loud enough that people can hear you. They, they you know, well, it, it, this is the way we would say it to people, especially when you can go look at another instrument, which many people know is, that, is out there, which is essentially a checklist. And you can get into that in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. requires no reading. You can jump right in and you're right there. Here's the issue. A checklist doesn't help you teach our severely involved kids. And the checklist that's out there, the APELS, is largely for higher functioning kids with autism. But our instru instrument is not an autism specific instrument. Our instrument is for people with more severely involved circumstances and situations. Our instrument is designed to go as low as you would ever need to go. This is designed for kids that have almost no voluntary movement, that are deaf and blind, that are severely multiply impaired, and a checklist will do them no good or no service whatsoever. It takes a deep involvement. It takes, there's a lot of issues with respect to teaching these kids that can't be defined in a checklist or a list of items. Uh, the very first manding item in Essential for Living takes an entire eight and a half by 11 page to describe the item because it, because it says to pe it has to say to people, don't teach more and please. And why don't you? Because a lot of people will. And then please don't start with break and, and, and stuff like that or all start done with, <laughs> or all done or want or some nonsense like that. And so many people do, you see. And so it had to deal with all of those kinds of issues. It also has to deal with people who are severely, uh, are severely self-injurious, severely aggressive, and people with multiple sensory impairments. And all of that can't be done with a checklist. So when people come to a sensory, they open it up and they go, oh, shit. Oh, there it is. Okay. Well, where you go is you go to the user guide in Essential for Living. In the EFL menu, it'll say intro and user guide. And that's the text that will hold your hand the first time you use it. If you use that, it will literally walk you right through how to start. It will take your hand and walk you right through. There's another one page handout and it's called what, what to expect and how to get started. That's on the same menu. And then about a month ago, we added a brand new video. And this video will again, hold your hand and walk you right through it. Is that, video, is that video on your website? And it's on the website. All right. And uh, just for uh, listeners' sake, I will uh, put that in the show notes of this episode. So if you go to behavioralobservations.com and uh, just look for the episode uh, yet to be numbered, <laughs> but uh, it'll say Pat McGreevy on it somewhere. And uh, we will make sure those links get represented in the show notes. So I'm sorry I interrupted. Yeah. I just want to make sure we, no, no, we can no, find it. Yeah, the, the video will literally walk you right through. It'll show you how to conduct your first assessment. First off, when people do an assessment, they expect a score. We tell them there's no scores. You know, uh, there are uh, there are eight essential skills around which the entire instrument uh, is devoted. And it talks about those. And in the introduction, it shows you what they are. And then the other pillar of the instrument is it has a whole chapter on how you develop language with somebody who's nonverbal. How do you select an alternative method of speaking? Uh, Dr. Carbone often jokes about, um, you know, you might get your pecs because somebody went to a pecs workshop or whatever it is, or they went to a workshop where somebody showed them, um, oh, what's that new software package that's so common these days? Proloquo. Proloquo on an iPad. There you are. You see that at a workshop, you get all jazzed about that. So you come back and, well, why does the kid have that? Well, because I went to a workshop. Sure. Well, now, wait a minute. That, that's not a, you know, 
Uh, and then, well, why is, you know, he doing it? Well, it, it looks good. It gives him great potential. No, absolutely not. So it, there's a whole chapter on that. Uh, part of that is written by a speech language pathologist who talks about when you should have an alternative method of speaking as opposed to staying with vocals if you're younger, uh, staying with spoken word approximations. So that's in the book. So there's a lot of those kinds of things that are more for people with more extensive delays and extensive involvement. I see. And so those would be good ways for folks to kind of dip their toe in, into the, the EFL waters. Yeah. Go into those videos and stuff like that. And it just expect that the first week or so will be a bit bumpy, not, not conceptually difficult at all. Hardly anybody says that. What they say is there's a lot of material. Yeah, you know, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of material. Yeah, I found myself when I first used it, I had to flip back and forth between pages uh, a bunch of times to, you know, cross reference where R142 or, you know, I'm kind of making the numbers up off the top of my head here, you know, things like that. And so I think that from a, you know, I, I think getting a, you know, those little post-it note tabs and things like that would probably be another helpful thing, you know, so you can kind of keep track of where you are as you're kind of going well, through the Well, the very book. first printing of the book didn't have tabs. And now the, the later printings of the book, we have color tabs and it's much easier to navigate now than the very first printing. Oh, cool. Very cool. Do you have any other tips or recommendations for folks who are considering the use of this program and, and don't have um, you know, haven't had a chance to go to a training or anything like that. Yeah, we, uh, we have, well, on our website, we post, uh, our conference presentations. We also, uh, uh like we just did one at, at, uh, uh, ABAI in Denver. We had about 25 people there. Um, uh, and we're going to do one here in Dallas in a few weeks and various places. And so people can always register for those. Uh, but they're in various parts of the country. Um, the easiest way is to use the video or the user guide. And then if you have trouble is to come to one of the, we have four every month online Q and a sessions that you can register for that. There's no money involved at all. You just register for them. You can do it on the website. We have one coming up this Friday, as a matter of fact, the 30th, it's already five or six people registered for that. And they just show up and ask questions. Okay. And you can come to as many of those as you want. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. And there's at least four every month. And so toward the end of the month, I upload four more dates and four more times. And you can find those. There's a separate menu on the, on the landing page. It's training in EFL. You look under that, you'll see them. Online Q&A sessions. And um, uh, lots of people join those. Um, and then if you have a group that you're working with, you've got a group in your agency and you want to schedule your own online with us for an hour or two, you can do that. And there's no charge for that either. Wow. That's uh, incredibly generous. Uh, so I'll make sure to have those, that specific, uh, URL to that page in the show notes as well. So that, again, guys, that, that it's something you want to check out at the, uh, at, uh on the website, uh, both certainly on, Pat's website, and again, I'll have the specific link to that at behavioralobservations.com um, um, uh, for this particular episode. So cool. I, I, those, those, those are new to me, so that's really, uh, it's really nice for you guys to spend that much time, and obviously it's a, you know, perhaps a permanent product of the, uh, the degree of passion in which you want people to you know, have these materials and be able to, to use them effectively. So. Um, I want to kind of transition away from the uh, EFL for a minute and just kind of talk about some just general practice issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I remember in our first conversation, you were, you mentioned some things that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, a, a way to describe it. Some sacred cows in our profession and things like that. I think one of them had to do with, uh, uh, reliability data and things like that. So from, from your perspective, can you talk about some of the, you know, what are, what are some things that we hold sacred that we may, that may not necessarily be as important or uh, to ask the question, perhaps a little more flippantly, you know, are, are there, are there beliefs that you hold that, that other people might think are crazy? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, without doubt. Well, for one, standard measurement. Uh, various people, fairly well-known people in our field, have referred to those who use the standard chart as a cult. Uh, in fact, they, they'll even say it to our face. That's a bit of a cult. Mm -hmm. And and um, uh, and so, yeah, that's that's that that sets you apart. One of the things that Ogden used to rail about was uh, this obsession with inter-observer agreement, or what initially was called reliability, but now people realized it really wasn't well defined with the well well described with the use of the term reliability. So that that. As you can, if you look back in older articles, you'll see that the term reliability sort of faded and it moved into agreement and it became referred to as inter-observer agreement. But it's the same phenomenon. And uh, it's it's two people counting the same thing. Uh, one person is busy doing it while they're counting and someone else isn't busy doing anything except counting. And um, and if the second per, if, if the counts come close to agreeing, we feel more comfortable with the count. Um, so let me that, step back for a second and say, okay, so what's wrong with that picture right there? Because that's, that's very common in terms of uh, you know, how these things are described in terms of the rationale and things like that. Well, it essentially begs the philosophic argument, truth by agreement. If a second person says it's so, does it make it any more likely that it's so? The answer is no, in many cases. Okay. Now, if, it, if it's a great, big, huge, monumental event like the lifting off of a space shuttle or some damn thing. Well, you don't even need the second person, but if you were l looking away at the time and had headphones on, didn't hear it, yeah, okay, the second person might be helpful there uh, because it's a big, big, big event that hardly anybody could miss. But um, let's say that I'm the second person with a clipboard and I count something. Am I, could I count something that didn't occur? just as easily as someone who's in the midst of doing it? Absolutely. And what happens if, let's say, I'm counting the number of times the person fists their forehead? All right, so what happens if the teacher's count is, is higher than the second recorder's count? So what happens if the teacher is 18 and the other person is 12 or 15? Then turn it the other way. What happens if the if the uh, uh, other person's count is higher than the teacher's count? Aren't those two very different phenomena? They are. And that really science in the natural science sense proceeds with replication, not within the experiment, across experiments. When I did a, a little study with a little boy with Lesh Nyhan disorder years ago, I sent it to the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. This would have been 1980, let's see, wait a minute, 1982. They wouldn't even send it out for review because it was on the standard chart and because there was no measure of inter-observer agreement, neither of which I would change. I sent it to developmental medicine and child neurology uh, based in London. They published it without hesitation. And when I mentioned a couple of the issues, the, the editor said, we don't think either one of those issues are even remotely important in science. So and that just, and that just brought it, what Ogden had always talked about, that brought it right front and center for me hell, the rest of the natural science world thinks it's ridiculous that there are two people in the room counting. If you want to know whether something is worthwhile, you replicate, but you replicate with a separate experiment, often done by a different person. And then if you get the same results, it stays, it, it, it remains in the field. If you don't, it drops out. I see. Because it was not replicated. That's our, that's, that's the thing that, that's a viewpoint among a few of us that wouldn't be widely accepted in our field, no. So I can imagine, if we were to go back to our conference scenario and having a beer, uh, that there was probably quite a few lively conversations around this. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, so I can imagine 
and 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 the point of bringing this up is not to to kind of debate this or anything like that. No, I'm no, not no. I'm not interested in doing not. that. Uh, I I no. I just love I I like hearing different perspectives and things like that. But I you know I could see someone making an argument, and I'm looking over my shoulder here, my bookshelf, and I'm looking at Johnson and Pennypacker second edition that I've I've had for you know a good twenty twenty five years or so, and I'm just thinking of the the, the notion of calibration and all that sort of thing, and you know internal validity and you know fun fun stuff like that. So. Um, well, and so, not only that, but external validity too. And and uh, 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 in the first edition of Johnston and Penny Packer, they dealt with that very in a very detailed way, and was and was one of the only publications ever in our field that systematically dealt with that very issue. You know, and uh, calibration and and uh, 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 interesting. But anyway, that's one of those uh, sort of. <laughs> areas where I I sort of separate and other colleagues of mine would do the same if we consider how our practitioners are, are trained right now is, is there a, a piece of low-hanging fruit in terms of changes to how we train people in other words what would be the the biggest bang for the buck if you were to, you know, could you, and I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but I'm just kind of, you know, what, what, what would be the, 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 the minimum, uh, I guess, uh, curricular item that you could suggest that would make the most impact in terms of broadening the perspectives of the, of the folks that we are training these days? Well, I had this conversation with a certain people in the certification board because I wanted there to be other items on the task list, which informs the exams, that have to do with curriculum, both academic items and functional skills items. I mean, there's nothing about direct instruction to speak of on the certification exam, and yet for our higher level kids, that's an amazingly effective curriculum, and it's behaviorally based. Um, and we should have all sorts of curriculum, but there's no curriculum options on the task list at all. And, and no seeming hurry for there to be any. And um, uh, I think we ought to have a curriculum classes so that people talk about what to teach as well as how to teach. But most of our field, for good reason, historically has been devoted to how to teach. And we are pretty damn good teachers. When people are trained behaviorally, they can make things accomplish, make things happen that other people can't. And, and that's to be, that's part of our wonderful history. But Ogden used to say it all the time. He'd say, but you can teach crappy, but crappy skills that don't matter in people's lives. <clears throat> you know, you can teach somebody the letters of the alphabet. But, but there are people out there teaching shapes to 17-year-old kids. If you're, teaching a, a, if you're teaching a triangle to a 17-year-old kid, I think you have to ask yourself, if he's 17 and he doesn't know what a triangle is, will a triangle matter in his life? Mm -hmm. and the answer is almost surely not. It won't matter. But a stop sign and a walk and a don't walk sign will matter in their life. But a triangle won't. Uh, I have a daughter who has Down syndrome. She's in her 30s. I'll bet you if you put a triangle in front of her and said to her, what is that? I'll bet you she couldn't tell you. But it wouldn't affect her life. In any way, mm -hmm. but she can tell you. But she can tell you that she has in front of her season four of Little House on the Prairie. Her little DVD packet. She knows that. Yeah, yeah, it's a meaningful, uh, <laughs> meaningful to her. Yeah, cool. She knows season four. She can see the four there. She knows the pictures, and she knows it's Little House on the Prairie. But she wouldn't be able to tell you what a triangle was. I see. You know? So. And, uh, she can go on the shelf and she can find a box of Cheerios easily and she can distinguish the large box from the small box. Very important skills. So I think that I think <clears throat> what we have to do as a field is we have to, and what Essential for Living is, is trying to get the ball rolling on is we need to be talking about kids that don't experience pre-academic or academic skills and they don't tend to experience both stimulus and response generalization, like other kids do. And we don't know basically why that happens, but it does. 
Uh, and so the situation in which you teach something is <clears throat> as important sometimes as the skill itself. And so, uh, um, you know, we have skills in essential for living that are, can you walk past a carving knife without picking it up? Because it's dangerous. Do you know not to put paper clips in your mouth? You know? Sure. And because pe people do. Do you know not to put cigarette butts in your mouth? You know? Um, when, you, when you encounter a, a, when you come to an intersection and you see a, a stoplight and you see a want, walk, don't walk sign, which one do you pay attention to? And people don't even think about that. Because if you just had the stoplight, you would obviously pay attention to the green light and go when it's green. But if there's a walk, don't walk sign, you shouldn't pay attention to the light anymore because the light's not what tells you what to do. But people don't think to teach that kind of thing. And yet it is extraordinarily relevant. People don't tend to teach things like never turn the hot water on first. I lost a student years ago while well, she was but who lost her after she was my student, but she died because of that. Really? Yeah, I've heard she situations into a like group home and walked upstairs before anybody realized where she was. And she turned the hot water faucet on in the tub, slipped and fell into the tub and died of shock. Right there on the spot. Yeah, I've heard I've heard of situations like that before. You know, and, and, and it's just it's it's and since you know, and, and since we work with those kids and have historically for years um, in the early days of our field, we, we were not very well accepted. Most people called us behavior mod in sort of a sarcastic way. And we had to, when we wrote grants and did things, we had to avoid the use of behavior analysis or behavior modification because it was so, you know, so many people didn't like it. Uh, but we have a long history of changing some pretty difficult behavior with pretty severely involved kids. And, and we're pretty good at it. I mean, we're the best toilet trainers on planet Earth. <laughs> yes, indeed. We are better than anybody else at that. And there's no reason not to brag about that. We're better than anybody else. No one's come close to us in that. We are the kings and queens of pooping. We are. <laughs> and we, we in and pooping, as they say in England, we're the kings and queens of that. We know how to do that better than anybody else. We're better at treating self-injury and aggression in people with developmental disabilities than any other discipline anywhere. We're the best at it. But we spent, you know, you know, years and years and histories of getting good at it. And we're pretty darn good at it now. And uh, um, so, Pat, you know, it, we've covered, it seems to me, like some of the concerns you have about the field in terms of of the things we've talked about. Um, let's look at the other side of the coin. You know, what, 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 what excites you going forward about our field? You know, if you were to kind of fast forward, a, you know, five, sure. 10 years or so, so you know, what, what are you, what are you looking forward to seeing more of that? Well, I think we have a great potential now to, uh, with the increasing number of people, <clears throat> excuse me, in the field, we have a great potential to make some pretty uh, remarkable changes that are noticeable to the rest of the world. But along with that goes a lot of responsibility too. Um, we have to get better at supervising our young people because there just aren't enough supervisors to go around. And we don't need a supervision course to do that. That's the silliest thing ever. We need, to, we need to make sure that the only people who do the supervising are the people that have experience to do it. And, and, and uh, you know, we can't be making our professors take a supervision class who have been in the field for 20 years. We just need to leave them alone and let them do the supervising. And, um, and I think that, but I think we have great, great potential. I mean, imagine... I mean, my certification number is 157, and we are at, what, 27,000 now. Mm -hmm. We have such incredible potential all over the world to make um, uh, just some pretty remarkable changes and to show people that behavior, um, to show people what Skinner talked about is that 
that we don't name a problem behavior and two weeks later use the name as the cause. The nominal fallacy doesn't become the explanatory fiction, which is psychology's long history. To the point where the DSM document is three times the size of what it was when I was a young man. And, and one, con one Ogden used to say there's three potential explanations for that. One, that we've gotten an awful lot sicker in the past 50 years than we ever were. Number, and we didn't realize it. Number two, um, um, we didn't realize all this was going on. And number three, we're just inventing stuff. We find, we find a problem. We find a way to call it. We find some instrument to diagnose it, and and then we have no options. We just call it something, or we or we medicate it, and um, that's what behavior analysis is. In, from in terms of the applied world, that's what behavior analysis is a resistance to. Is that no? We're not doing that. We're not going to do that. We're going to define something by what we see and what we have access to. And, and then we're going, to, we're going to rearrange the environment to see what we can do to make changes. And we're not going to bury it in some term that hardly anybody understands or give it some fancy diagnosis so that we have a code for billing. We're going to go after it. And we're going to say, listen, let's see how we can change the environment to make a difference. And I think when more and more people see behavior analysis for what it is, um, I think it's going to have potential for huge impact in the world. You know, just absolutely huge impact. People are now seeing it, it used in a whole variety of populations. Um, people with neurologic impairments, people with closed head injury. Um, and I think there's great potential. I see. Uh, well, Pat, I've, already kept you over the time that I promised would be at. Um, can I right. just ask you one final question here? Um, sure. What advice do you have for a, a newly minted BCBA? Let's say someone just passed the exam, they've got their certificate in hand, they're out looking for a job, or they may have just taken their first job. Uh, what, what parting piece of advice would you have to that person? Boy, that's a darn good question. And I appreciate you asking. Um, I just retired a couple of years ago from my on-campus teaching at FIT, and I still, people still see me as a professor because I have a couple of the videotape sessions at, on, for the online students at FIT. But um, I look at all the people that we're turning out today, and I say, you know, there just aren't enough people around to supervise. They're just, the physical numbers aren't there. Uh, there's some great people doing supervision. There just aren't enough of them. So I think what a young person today has to do is very similar to what I had to do. In the early days, it was very hard to find people to supervise you because there weren't that many people at all. Sure. There weren't that many people. For years and years, I worked in environments when I didn't, there wasn't even anybody to call, you know, or talk to other than Ogden. There was nobody else. There wasn't anybody around who knew enough that, you could feel comfortable with how they'd respond to you. Today, we have more and more behavior analysts, but that problem is still the same. So what a young person, I think, has to do is what I had to do. Take responsibility for your own competence and make sure you do everything to improve that competence. And remember that a BCBA just gets you in the door. It says you have the right now to do what people call behavior analysis, but it doesn't mean anything more than you're in the door and you have to take responsibility, go to as many presentations as you can, be careful which ones you go to, um, go to people who are recognized in the field for being good practitioners and good scientists. Um, uh, I always list eight or 10 or 12 of my favorite people, but then there's other people who have other favorites as well. I mean, um, uh, go listen to Merrill Winston and go listen to Jim Johnston, and go listen to Tim Vollmer. And when Jack was here, go listen to Jack Michael, and go listen to Dave Palmer and Bill Potter 
and and you can just rattle off people who are really darn good at this stuff. They really know their stuff, and uh, um, and uh, and go to those people and spend as much time with them as you can, and ask them as many questions as you can, and take responsibility for the development of your own competence. All right, that's uh, wise advice to to leave us on, and I uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that. And I always tell people too is to. Don't be shy about contacting these people. That's right. You know, um, right. I, I have been just completely shocked about how easy it is to get a response from somebody. I mean, sometimes it might take a, a, a follow-up email because, you know, obviously these days we're all getting several hundred emails a day. Um, but I've always found it really surprising about how easy it is to hop on the phone or trade some email correspondence with some of the largest names in the field. Uh, and I think it speaks to the fact where, you know, people spend their lives studying this stuff. They, they're talking about it's very reinforcing. So you, we, we can certainly analyze that from a, from a functional perspective uh, as well. So, um, Pat, I'm uh, really glad we uh, finally carved out time to have this conversation. And, so uh, I, I appreciate you're doing this, not just with me, but with all the other folks. I appreciate the kind of thing you're doing. I think this is uh, very, very helpful. I really appreciate that. It's been a fun project and, uh, you know, it's all, it's all driven by the listeners. You know, if no one listened to it, this, uh, this, uh, all the responses associated with uh, this podcasting w w would extinguish. So, um, so on that note, uh, thanks very much for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll have sure. you back on uh, some other time. Okay. All right, very thanks. good. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed what Pat had to say. If you want to learn more about Pat or the Essential for Living curriculum, head on over to essentialforliving.com. And I'll have that linked up in today's show notes as well as some of the things that we talked about. So head on over to behavioralobservations.com and look for session 31, Pat McGreevy, and you'll be good to go. So uh, in the meantime, thanks so much, and we will see you in session 32. All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>